I'm a grateful believer in Jesus Christ. I'm in recovery for alcohol, and my name is Neil. I was born into a military family. When I was about a year old, my dad was given orders for Vietnam, and we left North Dakota and went to Great Britain, which is where my mom, my sister, and my brother were born. Not long after my little brother was born, my dad was badly injured in the war, and we were sent here to Arkansas, of all places. <laughs> my dad spent a lot of time in the hospital, in the VA, and it wasn't long before my mom had a nervous breakdown. We were left with people in the military to look out for us. It was awkward for us kids to communicate because our accent and dialogue was much different in England, but we managed. The military flew my dad's mom out to help us. I was five years old at the time. I had trouble understanding people, so it was hard for me to make friends. I was picked on because I was different, so I tried to stay to myself. School wasn't fun at all because it was hard for me to communicate, and they put me in kindergarten, where in England you attend at four years old. I'd already attended. I did my best to get along. I became very frustrated at a young age. I wanted my parents home where I wanted to go back to Britain. When I was in the second grade, a man from the military brought us two ponies, and I was excited. It was finally some fun in my life. It took my goal of needing friends away, but even with being quiet, it just made me get picked on more. I was getting very angry. When I was in third grade, some older boys took me to the back of the playground where they held me by my arms and slung me in circles into a tree, slamming my legs to where I couldn't walk. They sent my grandmother to come and pick, pick me up and take me home. This was a key moment in building anger in my life. My grandmother told me no more tears and I had to grow up and defend myself. I told my grandmother that I would not cry anymore and I held that true for a long time. By this time, my dad was walking pretty good and he started teaching me how to defend myself but that really only made matters worse for me. You see, I later avenged the boys who hurt me, and that's when my troubles really started. I got into football to fourth grade and was good enough to make some friends. Remember the ponies? We sold them and I was able to get a big horse. When I was 14 years old, I had a horseback riding accident and eventually ended my football career. That was bad for me because without football, I found a new group of friends, friends that were a bad choice on my part. I'd already been sneaking around drinking beer at this point, but I had no idea what was in store for my life. Running with an older crowd and sneaking to rodeos wasn't good for me at all. By the time I was 15, my drinking was completely out of control. When I reached the 10th grade, my drug abuse was getting fairly bad. And with the crowd I was hanging out with, my fighting also got worse. I wasn't the kind to back down and getting hurt didn't bother me. I didn't care. In the 10th grade, it was hard for my dad to hide my troubles from my mom. She worked a B-shift as a nurse, and I started to come home later and later. I had good parents, a nice home. I was just a problem child. About halfway through the 10th grade, I decided to move out on my own. After all, I didn't want to worry my mom, right? I stayed in a little trouble, but not much major. I did get into a few serious fights that landed me jail time, but I don't want to make my testimony a war story. Somehow I managed to graduate high school, but barely. After high school, I attended some vocational school, but drinking and drugging soon ended that. I met a girl when I was 21. She got pregnant and my daughter was soon born. We got married a few, a few months later. It wasn't long after that when, my first, when after that my first son was born. And our relationship lasted about seven years. We had some happy times. I had stopped most drugs, but drinking and working long hours took its toll, and we got divorced. Not long after my divorce, I got convicted of a DWI, and not long after that, a public intox. So between child support and fines, my life was a mess. A few years later, I met another lady, and along come my second son, and my last. That relationship was short-lived. She left me, and I couldn't blame her. When my son was about four years old, a man in a church bus started coming by and inviting us to church. And finally I let my son go, but I refused. I didn't know God and I had no interest in learning. I thought God was only a myth. Every time that man would come by, I made sure I had a beer in my hand and I made it clear that I wasn't interested in his God. I would tell him to just leave me alone. Much like another man you will hear about later. <laughs> kind of funny in a way. I did, I did end up attending some cookouts at the guy's church. I was told to come back, but without beer. Imagine that. 
who eats barbecue without beer, right? <laughs> After a few years, I even taught some kids Sunday school. I was having fun and staying out of trouble. I had made progress, or at least I thought. I remember bringing a Bible to church. That's what they told me I needed. But when the pastor got up and said, get out the New Testament, I was upset because then I thought I'd need two books. But <laughs> we laughed later. After a few years, my son became friends with a boy who attended First Bologna, First Assembly of God in Bologna. So we changed churches. We had a lot of fun, and I volunteered there too. I know now God was using me, even though I didn't know it. I got laid off from a job I worked for 15 years, got into construction, and it wasn't long before I started drinking again. And I ended up quitting church altogether, which was a big mistake. My drinking was getting worse than it had ever been, but somehow I managed to get by in life. I, and as my drinking got worse, of course, so did my jail time increase. In 2016, a couple of guys broke into my parents' house, and my dad said they pushed him so hard when they hit his head that it, it hurt his head. We moved mom and dad into an assisted living, and not long in the new place, my dad was acting very strange. And my sister talked to me and going to the hospital to have some tests run. That night, he climbed the bed rail, hitting his head. The, doc the doctors operated on him, but the injury was too severe and he soon died. That was a bad day for me, and it turned out to be more than just a bad day. Remember the anger I had as a young man? As I had as a young man? You came back. I spent the next several months drinking heavily and hoping to find the people who hurt my dad. I started drinking day and night and barely eating or sleeping. Excuse me. The alcohol was taking its toll. I got to the point that I couldn't go but hours without drinking, and I was starting to have seizures. I had a seizure while working at Children's Hospital. It was then the doctor told me the alcohol was taking its toll on my body. Looking back, the alcohol was the reason that I hardly visited my mom. You see, I was focused on revenge. I was told if I kept drinking, it would soon take my life, and my mom would be at my funeral next. And I thought, how sad. In July of 2017, I started attending First and LR, but I was drinking so much I didn't get much out of it. My mug was always half coffee and half whiskey. Oh, how I love my church. <laughs> I, am, I am positive there were many people who knew I was drunk at church, but that's another reason why I love this church. When you come to First and LR, you matter. No pastor at First and LR will tolerate gossip. The one thing I never forgot was Pastor Rod talking about CR. Then my oldest son come over to see, what, see me one night. I was wearing shorts and the back of my legs were swo swollen and bruised. I had no idea why. He tried to get me to eat, but anything other than alcohol just came back up. Soon after that night, my son took me to Bridgeway for detox and I was not happy about it. I wanted to leave the next day, but the state police came and told me if I tried to leave, I would be taken to the state hospital. So seven days later, after Bridgeway, I was sent to a treatment center in Florida for three weeks, and I was glad to go to Florida. After about three days of detox, I was able to eat, and boy, did I. <laughs> I was told the bruising on the back of my legs was my body attacking my muscle. I had no body fat. My liver was damaged, and my blood pressure was very high. But everyone in there was so encouraging, and I learned a lot. Walking was hard for a while, but I managed. There were mostly young people there, and some of their stories were very heartbreaking, to say the least. Some people got out and died soon after, one at the airport. I learned a lot in Florida. There were several good pastors, one who always encouraged me. After that, I had 17 more days in the halfway house, and I came home, and I was blessed to have my job back. When I went back to work, not many had much faith in me, but that was okay because I didn't either. I came back to church, and Pastor Rod mentioned CR again. I started attending, and I would sit in the back and leave quickly. It wasn't long when this particular man started talking to me. I wasn't interested in talking. I just wanted to stay sober. That was my only goal. I didn't think God would offer me much. After all, I turned my back on him. After a few weeks, I did start attending a small group, but offered nothing. I refused to talk. 
I started going, I started going in to eat, and that's when a certain man started talking to me. <laughs> Not long after going to CR, I started a step study, which I did complete. It made me realize that I could have a better life. That man, who I just wanted to leave me alone, he started talking to me more and more. <laughs> okay, when my dad came back from Vietnam, he wasn't the same person. He wasn't the kind of person who gave hugs, and I wasn't the person who liked to be touched by guys or even to get close to guys. It seemed like this guy was always right on my back, and I hated it. <laughs> I didn't hate the man. I hated the way he got so close to me. Some of my bad language was in hopes this guy would just leave me alone. <laughs> Although I wasn't good at using appropriate language. If you think bad language will push this guy away, think again. That man who wouldn't leave me alone, he stayed on me. The man I'm talking about is Pastor Lane. <laughs> he asked me if I would start helping him on the parking lot on Wednesday nights, and I said yes. I was still struggling with my life, wondering how long I could stay sober. I asked God if he would put someone in my life that I could see God through. I prayed, and God answered, was Pastor Lane. I knew then God has a sense of humor, <laughs> right? Today, Pastor Lane is my mentor in school and my best friend. I know I can tell him anything, and he keeps his word to never make me feel uncomfortable or untrustworthy. Oh, by the way, the school I'm talking about is our song. It's Arkansas School of Ministry to become a pastor. Not anyone would have thought of that. Not anyone thought that would happen, and surely not me. Nothing negative has ever happened due to work in this program. Me being accepted to our psalm as a result of working my program and taking advice from godly people. Then, when COVID raised its ugly head, it changed life as we know it. Churches shutting down meant online church, CR online, and Zoom for small groups. I became very angry, and I refused to watch church online. I was disconnecting with church and people. Soon I agreed to the online way of life, but not for school. I did, I did not do well with online school, and really you could say I quit. I am now back in school, and I am once again happy. With COVID affecting so many people and drug abuse and suicide steadily going up, it has definitely changed my way of thinking. I am now helping with CR inside with the county jail and trying to be more sensitive towards the feelings of others. And I'm excited about the changes coming up in our church that are in store for us. Working my problem, working my, pro working my program has not only helped me, but it's helping me to help others. The Bible teaches us to love and to encourage others. In John 16, verse 33 is one of my favorite verses. Jesus tells us in the world that we have troubles but be of good cheer. He has overtaken the world, which tells me again that we do not have to live a defeated life. Step two is a step I really like. We came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. About any power was greater than me, but I chose Jesus as my higher power. Step 12 is my favorite. Having had a spiritual experience as a result of these steps, we tried to carry this message to others and practice these principles in all our affairs, which means to love everyone. I need you all in my life. I have learned to treat others the way I want to be treated, which means to drive the bus even when I'm worn out. <laughs> <laughs> to love you no matter what mood you might be in or I might be in. I see it as my duty to give back. To me, working the steps is critical. Working the steps has opened many doors for me. See, if I don't do my part in recovery, I will fall away from God. Loving God, is not, loving God alone is not enough. I have to put out my part, my effort. One of the most necessary parts of recovery is having a sponsor and accepting advice. I know my sponsor won't judge me, but he will tell me what I need to hear, not what I want to hear. A sponsor must be someone who will call you out when needed. To me, a sponsor is a coach and needed for success. A team without a coach cannot succeed. 
I was able to get two years sober with my mom, and I had restored relationships with many people. But a big obstacle in my life was that I couldn't get rid of my anger. One Saturday night service, I went up to the front, and I asked Pastor Rob to pray for my anger to leave me. It was controlling my life way too much. I prayed even more about my anger and God. But God revealed to me that my faith was in man, and I needed faith in God. As good as a man, Pastor Rod is, he is not God. I believe it's a pastor's job to teach and to guide and to love us, but let God be God. I had to learn that reading my Bible was not enough. I needed to learn how to have a relationship with Jesus, and spending time with him was and is my answer. To the newcomer, come to CR if at all possible or watch online. God is not a respecter of persons. He loves us all. It is not important where you are in your journey right now. It is all about where you want to be. Jesus is not seeking the ones who think they are good because none are good. We can only do a little better each day and keep attending CR. Come to church on Saturday or Sunday. If you do not have a home church, give Pastor Rod and his staff a chance. Here at First and LR, our motto is every soul matters to God. I believe that one of the biggest parts to recovery is knowing that you are loved. You are never beyond help. Our past does not have to be our future. Our God still works miracles. Join a step study. It is where you can deal with your hurts and hang-ups. Definitely go to small group. Some of you may need to change your surroundings. I had to. Do not put yourself in places that you know are bad for you. I heard a man tell a group of young people, show me your friends and I will show you your future. Maybe some of you need new friends. CR is not only about changing lives, it's about building new relationships. It is not healthy to be alone. If we fall, we need help getting up. Encourage each other. I'm not standing up here because I am good. I'm standing up here because I have worked hard to focus on God and to try to take at least the baby step in the right direction every day. Everyone has value. Everyone has something to contribute. People with a great deal of sobriety need the people who have little sobriety. I cannot forget where I was a short time ago. That is one reason the newcomer is so valuable. I know that most of you are not here because of drugs or alcohol, but anything in your life that is keeping you from the blessings that God wants you to have is sad. The more we spend time with God, the more he wants to bless us. Please don't let your defeats rob you of God's blessings or your program. Please keep coming back because it works if you work it. Four and a half years ago, I was close to death. I can't stress enough the importance of reaching out for help. God loves you and he still works miracles. I am 56 years old now and know this. It is never too late to start a new life. I believe CR is for everyone. And God is only a prayer way. You matter and you deserve a happy life. I want to say one more thing, then I will close. One of my biggest thoughts was that since I had turned my back on Jesus, why would he be still concerned about me? Right? Jesus loves us so much. He died on a cross for me and you. Jesus didn't die on a cross for us to give up. No, he died because he loves us and God is a God of second chances. Never quit. Get up if you're down, brush yourself off, and claim the victories God has in store for you. Yes. My sobriety date is May the 31st, 2017. Thanks for letting me share.